It's a bird. It's a plane. It's the 2023 Kentucky Derby Monster Pod. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital, coming to you from the Brooklyn Bunker. JK will be popping in to do about half of these interviews for these shows. You know the gimmick by now. Each horse that's going to be in the gate gets a guest. We go through the whole field. We're going to be chopping it up on YouTube into three videos. It'll be one long podcast for you to check out. And it is brought to you by our friends at the Preakness Future Wager. You can wager now at firstbet.com and expressbet.com. Goes right up until derby time. Really interesting creative bet that we had a hand in uh, consulting on. We definitely want to support it. Get in there. Take your shot. Each of the guests that you're going to be seeing today will be giving their thoughts. You can nick a tip from one of them. You can come up with your own. It's going to be fantastic. And it all starts right now. Our next guest on the Monster Pod, somebody I always love talking to, not just because of his tremendous knowledge, but also because I very much acknowledge the fact that I wouldn't be sitting here today without uh, his support over the years over at Daily Racing Forum. Absolutely legendary horse player, Eclipse Award winner. I could give the whole resume, but we'd be, you know, it would take the whole 10 minutes of the segment. I'm speaking of Stephen Christ. Steve, how are things? Things are good. Thank you, Pete. I love the way you phrased it when I asked you about a horse that you wanted to talk about on this monster pot. You very specifically said you wanted to uh, to defend Forte. And I think that's the right phrase is this is a horse who is very divisive. And, and it's, it's really interesting to me that you gravitate towards him because this is a horse who I feel like on traditional sort of form and class grounds does stand head and shoulders above the competition. It's on figures where the conversation gets injured. Interesting. And I know that their figures are of primacy in your, in your handicapping. Why did you choose to talk about Forte today? Well, yeah, I think that we, we all have this tendency when, when you go into the, the Derby every year to go, well, the first thing I'm going to do is throw out the favorite. Uh, th- and that that's some kind of a badge of honor just to sort of be contrary that way. And so maybe I'm, I'm sort of doing the wise guy level two thing, uh, which is to say, oh, not, not so fast. Uh, come on. There, there are plenty of years when I think it makes great sense to oppose the Derby favorite. Um, I don't think this is one of them. I mean, I'm not saying that this horse is some kind of a great bet at two to one, but I think he's going to be more like a seven to two, four to one favorite. And I think there is a much better than 20% chance uh, that he's the best horse in this group. Uh, so I, I think that he is going to be reasonable value. And I think he's a very solid horse in a year. Uh, he's not going up against some horse who just ran a, you know, figure of 105 or 110 dazzling the world with spectacular ability. You know, there, there are no flight lines in this, this group of horses and he's as good as anyone. And he has just shown up and done this time after time after time there is no reason to doubt him at this distance uh he's one of the few i think horses in the derby who you go he's actually going to get better going a mile and a quarter so you know come up with your wacky long shots and and clever ideas but don't miss out on the trifecta uh because fort runs a solid second or third or wins the race because i think he's a pretty legit horse you're describing him certainly as the as the, the the form yardstick, but I can't shake the idea that I'm hearing a what more or less amounts to a class what I would call a class argument from a speed figure man. What of his figures not being much better than the competition and the fact that he um, is going to be the favorite that doesn't give you a little bit of pause? Well, again, it's not that he's a, a phony or a fraud. I mean, he hasn't on figures separated himself from the group. I mean, if he had, we'd be looking at a six to five favorite, you know, instead of a four to one favorite. Uh, I, I just think there's, you know, a much greater likelihood that this horse is, is involved at the finish than there usually is for a derby favor because this isn't you know a speed horse coming off some dazzling front running win and now it's like oh he's going to have a lot of competition for the lead uh, or he may not get the distance believe me this horse is going to be right there you know there's half a dozen horses who are eligible 
you know, if they suddenly jump up five lengths or 10 buyer points, that could turn out to be clearly the best horse in the race. But someone's going to have to do it. You know, everyone else, uh, I think this horse wins the horse race in the final eighth of a mile. How do you personally view the Florida Derby? Was this a case of him getting the job done on what was maybe not his best day, as evidenced by him getting much washier than usual uh, b- before the race? Is that, I mean, I'm assuming if you're pro forte in the Derby, that's how you're looking at the Florida Derby, as opposed to obviously you're not looking at it as a potential uh, going down in form, or you'd certainly be on on team anti. But you know, do you think that race needs much rationalizing if you're on the, if you're in this horse's camp? Well, I I think that the most important thing about the Florida Derby is that this horse looked completely beaten uh, at the eighth pole. And he, I know it's a cliche to say he (laughs) found another gear. Guess what? He found another gear in that last eighth of a mile. I was very impressed that he won the race. It obviously, you know, wasn't him at his best uh, between being washed out and post 11, the way the race unfolded. Uh, To me, it was just very impressive that he was still able to win. We are sponsored today by the Preakness Future Wager, as we've been uh, talking about on various uh, points of this monster podcast. Curious to know if you want to uh, participate in our little bit of fun here and maybe get in on get in on the action, courtesy of our friends at the Preakness Future Wager. Sure. If I'm going to defend Ford for the Derby, I'll, I'll defend him for the Preakness as well. And, uh, you know, if that comes to anything monetarily, let's uh, just give it to the Third Red Racing uh, Foundation. Uh, you know, let's uh, let's do it for charity. I love it. TRF, Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, founding partners of ours here. You never need to twist our arm to include right. them. And I, and I think it's a smart play if you believe in this horse. You know, if he had, if if that you know paper superiority translates, I mean, this might be a legitimate triple crown contender. You, would you go that far? Well, as you know, I I don't think he's shown us the brilliance, raw talent of you know a triple crown winner yet. But if he delivers in the Derby, uh, you know, he's only had the two races this year. He's in great shape. I expect him to continue moving forward. So yeah, it it could work out that way. Be fascinating story to to follow along. That's for sure. Any particular horses you're interested in trying to pair with him at this stage, or are you basically looking to plant more of a flag that whatever you do, it will be around this horse, even if it's more vertically speaking. Yeah, I uh, I haven't figured out the race yet, and uh, the nice thing about being retired, I don't have to come up with an opinion until five minutes before post time. <laughs> I'm envious of you for that. (laughs) Something to look forward to. Great stuff, Steve. Thank you for joining us. Godspeed to you and uh, Forte in the Kentucky Derby. Here's hoping. Peter Thomas Fornital back with you. Very happy to be joined by a man whose uh, work I've enjoyed on the airwaves with uh, Gil Alexander over the years, the Beating the Book podcast over at VSIN as well, and uh, not to mention the, the work he does behind the counter at, uh, at the South Point out in Las Vegas. He's also a fantastic author. We'll get to that in a minute. He's Chris Andrews. Chris, what's going on, man? I'm doing great, Peter. How are you, my friend? Oh, it's Derby time. If you're a horse racing fan and you're not doing well now, I, I can't help you. What do you guys have anything planned out at the casino uh, for the for the Derby, or is it just another wagering day with a little more horse racing? Oh no, no, we all have a huge event. You know, pro- I, I think the biggest in town. I think a lot of awesome. guys have gone away from it. But we, you know, we have the ballroom and we'll have all sorts of food and drink specials. And I mean, besides Churchill and the Derby, we'll have all our tracks up there and. Uh, you know, extra ticket writers and all that stuff. So we, it, it should be a great event. It's something we still, you know, really concentrate on here at, at the South Point. That's awesome. Is it sort of a wander by thing or is it a tickets in advance? Oh, no, no tickets in advance. You know, come on right. up. I mean, the, the book, the race book will be open. But we have the ballroom upstairs. Uh, it'll be well signed and all that. But, uh, you know, it's free to go in and, um, you know, like I said, no tickets or anything like that. I mean, we, I think we, we see over... I want to say 750 people in that room. So you shouldn't have trouble finding a seat. Uh, we'll have plenty of TV so you can watch all the races and betting stations and food, spe- you know, all that stuff. So we do, we do it right. Love it. If I wasn't going to be at the Derby itself, I might be thinking of coming out there to uh, to see you. Now, that party is going to be a lot more fun if we can uh, come up with a nice winner to bet on. And even more fun still if – 
that winner is a long shot. And I know you have a, a horse. You're very interested to talk about this. Caught your eye on this show. Well, I, you know, Mage is a horse that I just really like. I bet him in the last race against Forte. And I do let me go on record. Forte is going to be hard to beat. But, you know, you got 20 horses out there. Crazy things happen. We have seen it so many times in the Derby. Uh, Mage in his third race, and I watched it twice again this morning just to make sure I was right. You know, he broke last in, in the Florida Derby, broke last. He was last uh, in the back stretch. Meanwhile, coming, he made a huge move on the turn, just a huge move. And, uh, you know, listen, he used a lot of energy. Forte passed him up in the stretch. But like I said, he's really well-bred. Uh, he's got a lot of stamina in his pedigree. I don't think getting the distance is going to be any problem. He had a ton of trouble. And I know Forte had his problems, too, from the breaking from the outside post. But like I said, Forte, and what's he going to be, 5-2 to two maybe, something like that. Whereas I think Mage, I, I think we're probably looking – you know, 20 to one, maybe 25 to one, something like that. Uh, I know there's a jock change. Castellano's on him. Uh, Castellano wrote him in the fountain of youth, wrote him the fourth place finish. Uh, Castellano's probably, you know, he's definitely not what he was a couple years ago, but he's still a really top notch jock. I think he's in good hands. Uh, Saez uh, went to um, uh, uh, tap it trice. Uh, which I can understand. He'll be probably, I'm thinking maybe 10 to one, something like that, maybe even less. So I understand the jock move, but I think Castellano, I think he's in good hands. Mage is in good hands with Castellano. Uh, and I'm definitely going to have him somewhere. You know, uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll have a win bet on him and I'm sure I'll use him in some exactas and trifectas with, with Forte, who I think is just going to be awfully tough to beat. It looks like a tremendous horse, but like I said, it's horse racing and 20 horses in the field hope somebody runs into a little bit of trouble and hopefully my horse can, uh, you know, make a move in the stretch. But I, I think, I think he'll be right there. We have a video about mage elsewhere on the YouTube channel with one of the owners, Ramiro Restrepo. And, you know, one of the points that came up classic old school handicapping, something Chris, that I know you appreciate when you look at that last run and you see the difference at the end of the race about one length, and you can argue that with that early move that Mage made, you you can actually, to me, really argue who had the tougher trip. But even without that, one length at the end, two horses that didn't have everything go their way. If one's going to be seven to two, five to two, and the other's going to be fifteen to one twenty one, I know where the old school wise guys like you are going to want to put their money. You and I have talked, and uh, I know one time we mentioned uh, I had Miesque when she was defending her crown. And uh, I stumbled into a guy that had her eight to one because my friend called me, says, you're going to bet me asking. I said, no, I don't bet two to one shots. I don't, I just don't do that. He says, well, what if I get you eight to one? Well, yeah, I'll take eight to one, of course. Um, yeah. So I think Mage, uh, is he as good as Forte? I, you know, I don't think he is, you know, but um, again, you, ju you just mentioned it, the, the difference in the price, you're talking about a length and horses that had some trouble. Um, yeah. I would take that price. And uh you know, I think we're going to have a pretty good shot at it. I forgot to prep you for this off air. So I'm springing this for you for the first time. Okay. So the, the Preakness future wager, a paramutual future bet from our friends at first is making its debut this year. And everyone who's a guest on this show gets a hundred dollar free roll that we will bet on your behalf for the Preakness future wager. You could more than happily put it right on Mage, the horse we've been talking about. You could take Forte. You could take all other three-year-olds. You could take a horse that's skipping the Derby and going to the Preakness, like First Mission or Blazing Sevens. I'm putting you on the spot here, but uh, what do you want to do, Chris? And we lost Chris's Call video. Right there. Yeah, we, we lost you, but now you're back. Yeah. What do you want to do with this uh, this this hundred? Oh, I'm gonna take Mage. I just, I just gave you the whole speech, Peter. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna, I get back out now. What kind of play would that be? <laughs> I like it. We'll put it right on the nose. Before you get out of here, Chris, I did want to talk to you about your books because I know we have a lot of people who hunger for material about uh, gambling. Some who just want to read great life stories. First, give us the skinny on your new book and then let's talk a little bit about your body of work and of course we got to let folks know where they can get them well my new book is called it's a greek title adel fosmo and in parentheses it's my brother and it's about uh you know the, the elevator speech i would say it's a uh, you know down and out 
gambler whose ex-partner has a son who's playing in his last football game as a quarterback. And uh, they, the team he's playing for is a big favorite. And he's asking, can the kid maybe instead of winning by 17, what do you think? Can he win by 10, 13, 14, something like that? And of course, they don't go for it. And uh, a lot of things happen after that. And, and the story revolves around the two brothers and, of course, their father. Um, who uh, and uh, you know it's one no nobody's uh, nobody's untainted in this book. Let's say that. And Peter, you know, probably the lives we lived, we know a lot of guys like that, including I, ourselves. At I, least I would say, including myself. Well, I think ourselves is fair. And I was going to ask you if there's any autobiographical elements in this story. No, not really. No, no. It, it, it's it's pure fiction, but something that I I had in mind that I think it you know. Um, I mean, could happen. I mean, I think when you read it, I, you know, the people that have read it says, you know, you really know these guys. And I do, I, you know, our lives, you know, like I said, I, I'm including you because I think you've probably lived a life similar to mine. Uh, we, we know people like this and I could see something like this happening. And uh, like I said, that that just kind of triggers all the action. There's a lot that happens uh, after that. And, uh, you know, I think it, so far it's been well reviewed. And uh, I'm very proud of it. I think it's an excellent book. I really, and I think anybody listening to this podcast would, en would enjoy the book. Even if it's not autobiographical, I think being living your life in a gambling milieu probably informs the story. And that's why it has those rich details. We'll have you back for a longer chat about the book at some stage. But I did want you to talk about some of your nonfiction work quickly and crucially let people know the best way to find your stuff. Well, the best way to find it, the easiest way is just go to Amazon. And I have a link on my Twitter, which is at Andrew Sports. I have a quick link there. The link immediately is to, is to the last book, but just page down a little bit. You can find the other two. The, the first book of mine is Then One Day and has a lot of gambling stories, including some pretty good horse racing stories in there. Uh, the second book actually has a few horse racing stories. It, it was uh, supposed to be a journal of uh, from one Super Bowl to the next, uh, the year in the life of a bookmaker. And of course, I chose 2020, the year of COVID, when everything went nuts. Uh, but I think people, you know, it's funny. Like I talked to Roxy Roxborough, Vic Salerno, guys that you know, uh, Gil Alexander. They love that second book because it's really, it's not as, for as broad of an audience as the first. The first book, I have friends of my wife's who don't know anything about sports. They love it. But the second book is really for more guys like in our business. And yeah. uh, there are a lot of a lot of interesting stuff that happened that in that crazy year that we had. That's called Then One Year. My first book is Then One Day. And, uh, you know, my publishers want me to work on a third one, which I'm working on right now. And love it. At, I don't want to I don't want to pump. I told him I try to get done by football, but I don't think it's going to happen. So. <laughs> don't rush. You can't rush. No, these. No. You know, sell no book before it's time to. to there you go. Oh, it. Um, and it is great. And, yeah, of course, there's horse racing in it, because for a minute there, we were the only game in town in 2020. Chris, thank you so much. We'll have you back soon for a much longer visit, but really appreciate you, my man. Okay, how am I going to get paid after Mage wins the Preakness? <laughs> I'll, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Okay. I'm, good. I'm good for it. <laughs> All right. We'll talk See you later, soon. Peter. Thank you. Cheers. Next up on the show, one of the most popular Monster Pod guests year in, year out. It was a, a few years ago in this very segment. She debuted her ASMR routine, which uh, listeners and viewers really enjoyed. Um, we've got her here today. You know her from the fantastic work she does on the Santa Anita simulcast feed, national television, the Owner's Box podcast, which you should definitely be checking out as well. I'm speaking, of course, of Michelle You, Michelle, what's going on? B, I, I thought we were talking derby. I was all prepared for derby, but I, I see we're we're dressed for Preakness. Should I go change? <laughs> no, no. It's we're talking both. We we have the Preakness future wager, which is available for people to get okay. involved in now. Bet at first bet or uh, expressbet.com. We're gonna get to that at the end for your hundred dollar Preakness bet. A uh, hundred dollars, a hundred bucks on oh, us. So, so that'll oh, be on you. great. That's a lot of my money. I actually made a hundred dollars on one horse yesterday. So I was going to have it if we had to use our own. There you go. No, but you're OK. You don't, you don't have to shell out your own cash. Of course, you can always bet more in this win only uh, pre this future bet. And we're going to get your derby selection too. maybe your derby selection is the same as the horse you're here to talk about. 
And that is practical move. See what I did there with the fancy slide. If you're watching all on, on YouTube, let's talk about practical move. Let's talk about the form of the Santa Anita Derby in general. I'm still like struggling with this race, Michelle. A lot of the figure makers have it fast, but I'm not so willing to take it at face value as one of the necessarily best derby preps this year, which is what it looks like when you're looking at figures. Where do you stand on? Is this a key piece of form? Is practical move a major contender? I think he is a major contender and it's not necessarily based on this race. It's the body of work that he's put in. Um, you know, he had a little bit of trouble early on in his career. And then when he broke through with the Los Alamitos race, I thought, I mean, come on guys, he circled the field. He had no one inside. It was just a dream trip where he just ran his own race, like in his own little world. And he won. I said, no way he duplicates that. And what does he do? He doesn't get to duplicate it, but his next race, he comes back and he rides the rail and he wins the race, right? Like he's just finding these trips that I keep thinking he's not going to be able to find this trip again. Um, And then he came in the Santa Ana Derby and he didn't get maybe the, the cleanest or best of trips, but he got a certainly a better one than Mandarin hero got. And, uh, even with a little bit of an early move, he was able to win again. So once a horse wins three times in a row in three different spots with different scenarios, it less becomes he needs a four horse field to win a race, right? Is he still as flashy as other horses? No, he wasn't as flashy as Angel of Empire. Is he as gritty as other horses? No, he's you know not as gritty as Forte. Um, but he's kind of worked up his own momentum, I feel like. He deserves every chance that everybody else gets at this. Um, I think that he's a deserving horse to take your money. I loved his gallop out. And he's just been training forwardly plus with all you know the 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 baffer and yachtine thing i think it's really cool that tim's coming in here and his best chance is a you know boots on the ground or a homegrown tim yachtine uh so i like that aspect of it and i think the horse is really cool we had the owners on our podcast and they were great they found this horse themselves um you know they didn't use a bloodstock agent or thing but they both went to the sale and found horses and he was at the top of both their lists um so i think that it's a great kind of like story to root for it's great people to root for and the horse he's been a little blue collar but that's not his fault and all he's done is win 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 so he he deserves his his day in the sun here if he wins Will he be on some of your tickets? I'm very sympathetic yes. to the point that if it said not if it didn't say Yachtin next to it, it said Baffert or Pletcher, he'd be half the price. That's intriguing. Yeah, sir. For sure, for sure, he would be right. It's like because we what we think that like Tim Yachtin can't get a horse to to do good. I mean, he's won Grade Ones. He trained under some of the best. Like uh, Tim does a really good job when his horses come over. They're schooled. They're turned out really well all the time. I mean, he fits the mold for all these big guys. He just hasn't had an opportunity until the last couple of years to have a big time horse, right? Like, I mean, he had mucho unusual, but I feel like a grade one winning grass marathoner isn't the same as a derby type to a lot of people. And and that's a fair statement, Um, but he can get a good horse ready and he's had a great, you know, year or two, especially when people have been giving him a little bit better animals to show, look what I can do. If you give me a little bit better horse. And, you know, that's a, trend I think that goes on with a lot of smaller trainers it's not just the top three that can get a good horse somewhere yeah it's a great point I'd love to see the talent spread out a bit not that we don't like those top trainers obviously we do but you know spreading the wealth makes for more competitive racing where do you want to see this horn horse drawn what kind of trip do you want to see him get that's something a game you've played very well on these airwaves before um, sort of predicting the Medina spirit uh, scenario a few years ago what do, what do you think practical move wants to be doing on the first Look, Saturday I think that this horse is a good horse, but because he's so blue collar, I don't think that he's your wonder horse that can overcome, right? He's not leapfrogging over horses. He's not going 10 wide to make the trip. I don't know if he is handy enough to go start, stop, start, stop, like we've seen some horses be able to do previously. So for me, I would love him to have like a kind of min- middle mid side straw. So like five, six, seven, eight, somewhere right around there where he can kind of break and get good position, but he's not buried down on the rail. Um, I don't want him to have to be too wide. He does have, I feel like when Ramon asked him in, in the Santa Ana Derby, an earlier move that he can kind of sustain. I feel like he can kind of go on and then come back if he can get a breather, which could get him into a really great spot. I want to see him moving early though. 
Let's talk about your Derby pick real quick. It sounds like, well, Practical Move is on your short list. You might have some others you like a little bit more for, yeah, for this Yeah, for me season. right now, I like Angel of Empire as my uh, my top selection. I just loved his Arkansas Derby. He's a horse that I feel like has a lot of upside to him. He's just starting to figure things out, and he looks like he really wants to go a lot more ground. So I'm using him as my top pick, but for sure, Practical Move is is in that mix, right? He's My, my Oaks Derby double is my big bet every year, and he's in my Oaks Derby Devil. Who's your Oaks horse? I, you know, I haven't delved too far into that. For me, I usually try and focus and find like six horses I like in the Derby. And then I try and go like two, maybe three horses in the Oaks. That's like kind of my my go to for, for what I do. And I, I don't want to say I don't take the Oaks too seriously, but I feel like the Phillies, they either like beat up on each other or we have a lot of horses unproven form that are capable. So, I mean, I just kind of Ooh, who feels good today? <laughs> <laughs> like I've had lemons forever. And I mean, like it was a nice one going lemons. back on that one, but that was yeah. a nice one for Dallas. I some, like, and that was literally, I saw a tray of cookies on Derby day and I'm like, Oh, those are cute. And I l- walked into the room and I sat down and there's like, that cookie is on my tray and it's the lemons forever cookie. I'm like, this horse is like 50 to one. Well, I got it better now. So I just randomly used her because this tray of cookies that I followed See? through Churchill Downs. You cannot get analysis like this just anywhere, (laughs) folks. Look to the cookie, as Seinfeld once said. Look to the cookie. Before I let you get out of here and get to work, I want to talk about this previous future bet. Who do you want to put your 100 on? You can split stakes if you'd like as well. Oh, I can? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I'd probably put like $20, $25 on our derby winner, whoever it may be. Okay. No, no. Well, you don't know that yet. The, the, you, the bet closes with the Derby. You have to make this bet oh, before the Derby. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Then. So I'm going to just go ahead and who, okay. I'm going to split it. I would probably pick four horses and put 25 bucks on them. That works. Okay. So, uh, I feel like I want to put $25 on Mandarin hero. Okay. In case he doesn't get in and he bypasses and comes in fresh. Yep, I like that, especially um, if you like that Santa Anita Derby form line. That makes sense. I'm going to put $25 on Forte. Okay. Okay, because either if he wins, then I mean, whatever, he has a good shot to win the Preakness, I think. If he doesn't win and something crazy goes on and Pletcher's like, you know what, I, I need redemption, I'm going to run him back, that's a horse that can turn back and win the Preakness. Okay. I'm going to put uh, $25 on, whew, who else could I play right here? I'm going to put I mean, it makes sense to use your derby horse. Yes, on, on Angel of Empire. And I'm going to put $25 on who's fast. I don't I don't want I don't like Jace's road. Who else is going to be up near the pace? Burma Sotagake. I think he'll be. Yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, the thing is, is if he doesn't run good, they're not going to go on. Right. right. So. Uh, Verifying. No, I don't like that horse at all. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think of who might be the speed. I know. I'm trying to think, 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 think. What if we just say who? Who else is there? I'm living on such a love to practical part. move. Oh, yeah. I mean, but if see, that's the whole thing, right? Too, because does practical move go if he doesn't run good? There's also an all others category. Oh, the all others. Twenty five on all others. Yes. Excellent. All right, Michelle. A rocket can, well, to be honest with you. Oh, you could do that too. He he has his own betting interest. You uh, you pick. All right, I'm just gonna put 25 on Rocket Can then. All right, Rocket Can, Angel I'm of Empire, it up with Forte. Four yeah, I. Well, I mean, I'm gonna take out have... Forte. Now I'm gonna take out Forte then, because he's just gonna be bet 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 right. right so you're taking out Forte in favor of Forte. all others. Yes. Okay, Mandarin I'm Hero, all others. You, by the way, I talk too much for five minutes. <laughs> Well, we got it in just over 10. We'll settle for that. If you're late at work, you can blame me, and we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you on the owner's box, Michelle. Thanks, Pete. Richie, I, I see uh, the, the the racetrack that you dominated throughout your career. Aqueduct in the background, how are you? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm sitting outside of Aqueduct. I grew up about nine miles from here, and uh, it's the first track I ever came to see races and won a lot of races here, so it's a, a, a great source of pride for me. Richie, I remember we were on Fox when Hit Show ran second 
in, uh, in, in the Wood Memorial. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about Hitchhow. You had such an interesting idea about him running into that first turn. I think we both were impressed how he ran despite the trip. What are your thoughts on Hitchhow? Yeah, listen, I, I think he had a very tough uh, task in the Wood Memorial, breaking from that post. Uh, he did well to not lose as much ground as he potentially could have. But still, it, it, you know, he had to be used, maybe taken out of his game a little to find that position. Um, and then, you know, I thought Manny gave him as good a ride as he could with the hand dealt him. I still have my doubts about him getting a mile and a quarter. And that's obviously a, a big part of it. Richie, I'd I i I'd be remiss if I didn't talk to you about some of your other thoughts about the race. You've, you know, you've, you've won thousands of races as a rider. Um, and I want to make sure that, that we get those those opinions from you. Um, before we got on, you were talking to me about a work that you saw that you were very impressed with. I want to give you a chance to talk about that. Yeah, head and shoulders above any of the other works I've seen. Disarms work under Joel Rosario. Um was phenomenal as good a work as i've seen his mechanics of his stride are just impeccable and that's kind of been a benchmark of his sire gun runner he throws horses that mechanically are just so physically sound and i love the way he got up underneath himself i think he will absolutely run the race of his life in the derby Wow, absolutely. That's that's outstanding. It's, I think the, the confidence that Steve has kind of shown in the horse to to run him in the Lexington and then to run him back off of that in short rest, I think that says a lot. Uh, what other horses uh, have gotten your attention throughout this Triple Crown Trail and then in the mornings as well? Well, uh, Angel of Empire, uh, to me, the way he won the Arkansas Derby, making that long, sustained run, I, I've always been uh, of the belief that horses that win the Derby – your free courses aside, like a Seattle slew or spend a buck, you know, the horses that just have blazing speed and can carry are generally won by horses that can make a long sustained run or two distinct runs, a run to position idle, and then give another run, which, which is an unusual ability to have for most horses. Um, and angel of empire made that long sustained run in the Arkansas Derby. And he was putting separation on a field. And sometimes you get caught up in while well, horses winning by open lengths. But if you look behind them, it's because everybody else is struggling and, and they're 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 not, you know, they're coming apart, if you will. His stride did not deteriorate. He was widening on the field because he had his legs up underneath him through the wire. And I think stamina is a strong suit and that ability to make that long sustain run. He at this moment before we actually have drawn the race is my top selection. Richie, we've uh, we, we've got a hundred dollar free Preakness future wager for you. I, mean, I know we got five weeks. Uh, six weeks almost until then. But uh, is there any horses that have gotten your attention that you'd like to put that $100 wager on to win the Preakness? Uh, Steve Asmussen's horse, uh, Red Route 1. Uh, I loved his last race at Oakland. I think he's a horse with a lot of ability that hasn't kind of put it all together, but I thought it was a positive step forward, albeit against easier company last time. And I just love the pairing of Joel Rosario with that kind of runner. He just has this knack of producing horses with that last run. And if Joel Rosario is riding him in the Preakness, it, it elevates him to me. I, I, I'll, I'll take a swing of Red Route 1 as a future wager in the Preakness. Meg, I appreciate the time going there to that racetrack that you've won more races than, than any other jockey. Enjoy your day today, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Jonathan. Always great to talk to you. Next up on the show, a member of the home team. Not only do you see her all the time on Fox's America's Day at the races, but you've also hopefully listened to her on this network with her show, Off Track, one of the most popular racing broadcasters and the rare racing broadcaster who has a better hat collection than me in the Money Media Zone. Maggie Wolfendale Morley. How are you, Maggie? I'm good, Pete. This is a nod to you. I knew you would appreciate me wearing this. Plus, I'm testing the limits on how far and how long you can use dry shampoo. So I'm just <laughs> keeping the hair under me. <laughs> you know, Plus, it's a little rainy, you know. <laughs> we're, we're learning. We're truly learning how the how the sausage is made here on today's <laughs> show. Well, this is this runner that we're about to talk about. Ray's cane is one that I, uh, you know, sometimes depending on where we are in the flow with these shows, uh, sometimes the guest picks, sometimes they have a runner foisted upon them. This is one I, I foisted upon you. But I was curious because you had a chance to see Ray's cane at the uh, at the Gotham Stakes Day card. Very curious what you think of this horse just as an individual 
And uh, do you think he has any shot in a race like the Kentucky Derby? You had to hoist him upon me, didn't you, Pete? <laughs> the one horse that I was underwhelmed with, to say the least. Uh, at least from a physical perspective. You know, <laughs> such a funny picture of him, too. With a loose horse to his inside, poor thing. Uh, poor loose horse, I should say, who actually ran a winning race without yes. J.D. Acosta that day. That's right. Um, look. He did it on a very wet track, winning that Gotham. It, it was a one-turn mile. It was a complete pace collapse. So it, it's a race that virtually fell into his lap. And that's fine. I mean, he won convincingly. Don't get me wrong. But holy smokes, talk about a great ride by Jose Lascano that day, too. You know, it, it seemed as though he kind of wasn't handling the surface. Then he makes this decision to cut down and save ground around the turn. The, you know, the other horses kind of part the Red Sea and he shoots on by. And look, like I said, things landed and went his way. And I don't think he ran that bad of a race in the bluegrass. I actually think he ran okay in the bluegrass, you know, given the way that the race shaped up a race more forwardly dominated. He had a bit of a, you know, second half of it, a wide trip, and he was staying on. Now, the Derby, I think the biggest question about the Derby this year is what kind of pace scenario are we going to see? Is he a horse that, you know, are we going to see, because there doesn't look as though there's much pace on, are we going to see a lot of people try to go and send? Uh, obviously, the Japanese horse, I think he has a lot of speed, and I think he'll garner a lot of attention, and, and rightfully so. I mean, I feel like this might be one of the best horses that they've brought over. Still don't know the overall quality of that, you know, UA Derby. But as far as Ray's King goes, if suddenly they decide that, yeah, everybody's going to go. And he gets the pace to run into. He will be picking up the pieces late. But, but it sounds I, like... I to answer your question, very unassuming type. Mm -hmm. And looks like one that would relish a wet track, which, you know, he's one of those horses that he probably doesn't improve. He just, you know, handles it a bit better than some others. So um, if we come up with a wet derby, uh, wet Churchill surface, like we have quite often recently... Maybe he moves up a bit in my eyes. Maybe, maybe an underneath situation under the right circumstances. But I'm hearing a lot of ifs, ands, or buts uh, in your analysis of Ray's Kane at this stage. Is there a runner who stands out to you on the trail as one that you you have already been on record or would want to be on record uh, saying nice things about for this year's Derby? Well. This is this is one of those rare derbies where I feel like the horses that I like are probably horses that I prefer for the Belmont. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I'm totally getting ahead of myself, but Angel of Empire and Tap It Trice. Um, they're just these big, long bodied horses that have you know quite the stride to match it they you know take a little while to unravel it though i will say angel of empire seems to be getting handier with racing experience which i appreciate i like him a lot he's flattered by two fills if anything i kind of like two fills it, it's kind of a funny background story where um they had originally bought him as a pin hook and um I believe it was toward Gladwell. I might, I can't exactly remember, but they didn't sell him. So they sent him to Larry Ravelli because he didn't work well on the synthetic surface at OBS, go figure. Um, and so they sent him to Larry Ravelli and I think he breezed once and Larry was like, I want 50% of this horse. So he, he bought into him and the fact that he goes and wins the Jeff Ruby stakes stakes, he on a surface that he was perceived not to like, and he yeah. ran so well in the risen store, I think behind um, uh, Angel of Empire, he's definitely high up on my list. That's an interesting one. That's an interesting poll for sure. And that's a great bit of info I didn't have about mm -hmm. supposedly not, you know, maybe not only just moved up on the synthetic, but, but a horse that, that maybe is meant to be better on the dirt. Now, we don't have a Belmont future bet for you, unfortunately, but we do have this Preakness future bet. How would you like to spend your, uh, your, your 100 in that pool? Well, I'm going to take Blazing Sevens. We've seen Chad Brown, the trainer of him, do this often. I wish I'm hedging totally, but I wish he was heading into this race in a little better form, shown a little bit more as a three-year-old because I loved him as a two-year-old. But 
Chad Belch has been so successful in doing this, skipping the big dance and pointing these horses to the second jewel of the the Triple Crown. Uh, he did it with cloud computing. He did it with early vo voting. And I think he's a horse that should handle the Preakness. In the back of my mind, I'm knowing verifying, verifying sticking out in the back of my mind. But for this bet, we're doing Blazing Sevens. Okay. Um, I think verifying the distance of the Preakness is probably a little better than him. If he, and if he decides to go Derby Preakness, then he would be an interesting player. But um, yes. I'm I can let you split stakes if you want. If you like verifying Ooh. enough. Yeah, you, I'll, I'll throw that uh, uh, option out there for you. All right. All right. I, deal. <laughs> All right. We'll split there. While I have two more things we have to talk about. One, I think it would be a host fail if I didn't ask you about Forte, because this is a horse you had a lot of opportunity to be around as a two-year-old two have you had a chance to be in the same place with him as a three-year-old have you watched any of the tape um on the workouts i'm just curious if you have an opinion if this is a horse what when you saw as a two-year-old looked likely to develop into a better three-year-old or i mean i guess in many ways the key question with him is is he going to develop or did he just get much better faster than everybody else and now they're catching up yeah, no, he actually did have the frame of a horse as a two-year-old that could develop into, you know, a bigger, more impressive, stronger individual. He was always athletic, but there, he was a bit unfurnished as a two-year-old, but he was also because he was so athletic, he was so handy. He was always putting his rider where he needed to be. Now, I, I think a lot of us weren't necessarily in love with his Florida Derby performance because he wasn't the same Forte that we had seen where he Looks just took the rider there. Yeah. Right. He had to be asked and asked and asked. Now, maybe that was the way Todd trained him. I don't know. You know, maybe we're, you know, priming for that third start off the bench, which is going to be the Derby, the big one to win, the one you want to win. And so I think Forte is a horse that, he has the right running style uh, for the Derby. And yes, I feel as though he's one that has to be respected, right? I mean, he's a champion two-year-old. They don't often win the Derby, but he has all the accoutrement to say that he's a deserving favorite and a likely winner. I did not love his first work back after the um, Florida Derby, but the one at Churchill he looked much more like the usual forte that we've seen. So it's kind of going to be interesting to watch him in his preparations and how Todd brings him along leading to this first Saturday in May. Well, the good news is we're going to have our show. This key question is one of the many that we'll be looking to answer. We've got a bunch of events, Derby Week, including... That's the Wednesday one. You're not part of that. But this one here on Thursday at the Galt House, you'll be with us. We'll be talking to you with your updated opinion of how he looks. And not just yep. that, it sounds Can't like wait. you might be able to join us for one of these uh, TRF events out at Chestnut Hall as well. Did I hear that? Rumor I am, yes, definitely going to be there on Tuesday evening with you. Excellent. And the bourbon tasting is going to be that night as well. So, folks. I'm leaving that to you. Much more, <laughs> I'll have the bottles on there. Well, you you I you enjoy the, the the wee dram from time to time. We'll get you going with us. But yeah, we've got a great line of whiskeys, and uh, Maggie and I are going to be chatting with. We'll be chatting Derby, and we get a chance to see the amazing operation out at Chestnut Hall and learn a bit more about how the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation, on which Maggie is a board member, takes care of horses and humans. So, if you want to sign up for any of our live events, including that Wednesday in Lexington. The Chestnut Hall ones on Tuesday, Thursday, or the big one at the Gold House on Thursday, in the moneypodcast.com slash live. That's the place to go. Read all about that and learn more. Maggie, thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to seeing you in Louisville. Can't wait. Can't wait to be there with you and with everybody else and uh, watching the lead up to the Derby. Dale, what's going on? Uh, Jonathan, just walking down the shed row. What's going uh, on? It's uh, it's it's around the corner. Derby week is upon us, and there's there's not a the Derby's not uh, doesn't seem normal if you're not in it. Uh, well, it's, I want to be in it. I don't want to wish bad luck on anybody. Somebody has to have a bad day for me to get in, but I do want to run. Well, tell me a little bit about Cyclone Mischief. You had that big race down in in, in Florida, and and what do you think about his chances if you can get in there? I think he's a horse going the right way, and he's doing really well. And uh, you know, he got beat three lengths to the favorite last time. So he's, he's, he's getting a little better as he goes. He, he's a mayfoe. He just, he's just going to be three when they run. He's not even three yet. But So he's gotten a little bit better. 
you take the one race out of his form at Gulfstream when he ran so bad, and uh, and he he looks really good coming into me. Dill, you've 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 basically grown up at Churchill Downs. You've seen a lot of these races. What 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 do you what is it? What kind of horse do you think it takes if you got to kind of design your own horse to win the Kentucky Derby? Well, I, I think that changes, and I think it has changed over the years. I think now with the point system eliminating a lot of the speed horses, looks to me like you need to be fairly close, and you have to have a horse course that'll get the distance, and a horse that can overcome adversity. Because in a twenty horse field, I don't care where you are unless you're on the lead all the way which you'll be working hard to do that, you're going to have to overcome some adversity. I like to see uh, horses that have run in big fields and uh, show they can beat a bunch of horses. Now, you've, like I said, you've, you've, you're, you know, you're a, a, a wonderful horse trainer. You've been around the game for a long time. You know, I, I trust your opinion about your horses, but I also trust your opinion about horses in general. Who, who have you seen that's been training really well that, you know, I, I'm not saying you would switch places, but who would you like to switch places with? possibly uh and, and train one of these horses that, that should get in the gate well you know it's forte's race to lose i'm a big fan very impressed with everything he's done of course todd's not going to make a mistake you know ever i'll be dotted never t be crossed a lot of them out there looking good my source looks good a big great colt uh what's the name can uh something can oh rocket rocket can rocket can i like the way he's trained over here and of course bill mutt handling the horses He's one of my all-time favorites. It's, uh, but the whole field looks pretty good. They all look pretty healthy. And, you know, there's some rumors about one here and there. Might might not be 100% to make the derby. They could let us in. But overall, it's a solid group. But if I had to pick one, I mean, it's it's a cop-out to say it's a favorite and a champion two-year-old, but he hasn't done anything wrong. No, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think he wows you on on numbers, but he wows you on what he's done on the racetrack and overcome a lot of adversity and, and – uh, and and yeah, I mean, I, I it's it's a tricky derby because there's not that there's not that speed figure standout. We've had those in years past. No, there, there, there's not. And uh, you know, I'm not a big speed figure man. I don't know you're you're. I mean, you handicap for a living. I just do it to buy horses, but I don't get hung up on speed figures. I like speed figures in regions. I don't like when you're comparing one region speed figures to another region speed figures. You got different people doing those numbers, and. Uh, if they're all together all winter long or all summer long, then I'll pay a lot more attention to it. But when they're coming from all over the country into one spot, I don't know what your opinion is. I don't pay quite as much attention. Yeah, it can be a little trickier. Um, Dale, uh, we, we, uh, we, this, this, this whole podcast was sponsored by the, the Preakness Future Wager. So uh, we're, we're giving all of the guests a $100 free bet. I'm going to go ahead and give your 100 on Cyclone Mischief. So uh, if you don't get in here, I'm assuming you're going to probably point to the Preakness. Or if, even if, if we, you win this one, you'll show up for the Preakness, right? I, I love the Preakness. Let me tell you, that, that is one of the best run events in horse racing. It's one of the most fun. They treat horsemen so good. I have, got lucky and won it one time. been second in it three times. I'll be there if we can get there. All right, Dale, I appreciate you. We wish you the best of luck this week, next week, and uh, basically every week moving forward. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, we'll see you next week. All right, bud.